We ask workers at remote places like forest officers, oil rig workers, etc. What creepy things have you noticed while at work? It was our 10th anniversary, so we decided to go camping, just the two of us, and of course, our dog. We asked my mother-in-law if she could take care of our son, and she agreed, so we were glad to have some alone time together. There's a big national park camping area near where we live, little less than an hour drive, so that was where we were heading. It's basically a big forest with many small lakes, ponds, trails, and camping sites around pretty popular place during the summer, but we still saw some people even though it was late September and the weather was cold. We found a good spot next to a lake and set up camp. It was a beautiful day, so we wanted to hike a bit in the forest. There was a nice long path that was going around the lake where we had our camp, so we chose to go that way. The lake was quite small and there was another camping site by it. You could see there from our camp, they were almost on the opposite side of the lake. We walked past another camp and saw a man there alone, just standing and staring at us, not answering when we greeted him. He was maybe in his late 20s, around the same age as us. I thought at that point, he was maybe just shy and a little weird. He had a small tent set up and some other stuff all around the place, so I figured he's been there for a while. We just continued walking and did not think much of it. Eventually... We got to our camp and started to set up our tent before it's too dark. We made some food by the fire and just sat there enjoying the peace. Suddenly, our dogs start barking like crazy. She was tied to a wire around a tree. We immediately realized that she wasn't just paranoid and that there was really something in the woods and it was near. It had been very dark for hours at that point. I took the dog to a leash and my husband started to look around with his bright headlamp. Our dog just kept barking. We were confused and sure it was some kind of animal, maybe a bear or a moose, but we couldn't understand why it wasn't scared of us and why it would not run away. My husband went ahead to the path that leads to another camp. Right when he got to the path, which was just less than 10 meters away from our camp, he saw something on the ground. I told him to go check it out and followed with our dog. He stopped, turned at me and said, It's a human, lying on the ground. The first thing I thought was maybe they were hurt or even dead or something. They just laid there not moving facing the ground. We asked, Are you okay? Are you hurt? And they just suddenly stood up. Turned out, it was the guy from the other camp. He was very scared of our dog and told me not to let her near him. I was kind of relieved that it wasn't some creepy bear that was going to eat us, but as soon as I learned that a bear might have been less scarier than this guy. After he stood up, he walked straight to our campfire and sat down. My husband tried to ask him multiple times why he was sneaking in the dark forest without any light. He did not give us an answer. We even laughed a bit and told him how we thought he was a damn bear or something. He did not even crack a smile. Just stared at the fire, looking annoyed. His right leg was soaking wet. We probably thought he stepped in the path and dipped it on the lake on his way to our camp. He sat with us for 30 minutes, not talking much. He also clearly wanted to know where our dog was, at all times. I saw he had a knife hanging from his belt, but I guess it's not that weird when you're in the woods. Every few minutes, he put his hands in his pocket and just peeked out at whatever it was in there. Kind of like checking the time on your phone without taking it from your pocket. But it was not a phone he had. I felt very uncomfortable and anxious the whole situation. So, when the 30 minutes passed, he again stood up, mumbled about going back to his own camp and left. He never gave us any explanation of why he came to our camp and why he was talking to us in the dark. He tried very hard not to be seen when we did find him. When I thought he was far enough... I told my husband that there's no way I'm sleeping in that tent. The biggest nope ever. Fortunately for me, he agreed and said the guy might come back when we're sleeping. I just wanted to leave ASAP. So my husband started packing things up and our car was nearby, thank God. I was guarding and looking around with the light if he comes back. Just when we had almost all our stuff in the car, I saw a quick flash of light on the path from the guy's camp towards us. He was 
coming back. Maybe he thought we went to sleep because he could not see our campfire anymore. So yeah, we got in the car and left really quick. I don't know if we overreacted, but I had such a bad feeling about him. Who crawls in the dark, wet forest alone just to stalk some strangers? What would he have done if our dog would not have heard him? What were his motives? Maybe stab us to death when we're sleeping? I don't know, and I did not want to stay there to find out. I'm just glad we had our dog with us. There's a chance she saved our lives, but I agree. People are the scariest thing to find at night when you're camping. I was out camping with my friend Josiah in the mountains of Pennsylvania. It was the weird in-between season after winter, but before spring really kicks off. Still no leaves on the trees, but the day of hiking to the camping spot was about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I brought a small rifle as we wanted to do some plinking while we were out. We set up the camp at about 3 p.m., leaving plenty of time for shooting. Just two buddies, shooting guns, out in the middle of the PA mountains. Incredible day. Night began to fall upon us and the air began to chill, and we built a fire for the night. Breaking out the bourbon, we talked about everything from future plans, girlfriends, and how society sucks. Josiah was used to camping, an industrious guy who had a passion for the outdoors, but, to put it kindly, was not the smartest person I've ever met. From across the next mountain, we began to hear coyotes. This is common when camping in Pennsylvania. Something you should know about coyotes is that they're incredibly noisy and you can hear them calling from miles away. Coyotes are also completely terrified of people and, therefore, not a danger in the slightest, or so I thought. The coyote calls were getting closer. Fine, we thought as they were probably just using the trails to move more efficiently between the mountain peaks. This comfort and logic dissolved over the next hour or two as the chilling howls kept getting closer. Josiah casually mentions that coyotes are close, but he knew as well as I did that they were avoiding us. Shortly after he said this, the calls stopped. We were in complete silence. The pops and flicker of the dying campfire was our only indication that time itself had not frozen. The bushes behind us started to rustle. Grabbing my flashlight, I scanned the woods around Josiah and me only to catch the reflection of about a half dozen set of eyes in the half circle around us. We both realize what is happening at the same time. Josiah grabs his rifle fully loaded and hands it to me and in return, I hand him the flashlight. I slowly chamber around into the semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle, realizing I probably don't have enough firepower to stop all these damn coyotes should this situation continue to escalate. Josiah and I stand with our backs towards the fire, him using the light to illuminate each coyote the moment they break a twig underneath their movement. The coyotes once illuminated let out a bark, then move behind a tree. It appears as if hunting us is a game to them. As we stand there, playing this game of high stakes flashing tag with a rifle, I come to presume that these dogs are coming out at a very harsh winter and probably starved. They stand off last for hours. Just as quickly as they surrounded us, they vanished into the blackness of the forest, only to resume their hunting calls on the mountain. I slept with a rifle that night. To this day, I still don't know what typical harmless animal made us fight for our lives that night. The next morning, the situation did not get any better. Central Pennsylvania has had odd weather snaps. The day before, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This morning, there were about three inches of snow on the ground. Temperatures below 10 degrees and heavy snowstorms rolling in. This was uncalled for by every weather agency I checked before we set out on this adventure. We packed for temperatures as low as 30, not this tundra. Hands were bright red, dexterity lost. I've been cold before, but this was the first time I was cold and unprepared enough to worry. Forget cooking breakfast, we need to get out of here before the snow picks up. We tear down the tents, put on as many layers as possible, stretching shirts over each other, pack our bags, and clean the site in less than an hour. We make our way down the War Trophy Mountain that we battled for the night prior, but the trails below are covered by unpacked snow. We were going to have to use the map and compass. 
we were also going to have to trailblaze through the more difficult terrain if we wanted to make it to the car. We find a felled tree, laid out the map into the quickly accumulating snow, and try to orient ourselves. If you've never been cold, hungry, and most likely dehydrated, while trying to identify mountain peaks and where the correspond on a map, then let me be the first to tell you, it's an aggravating experience where any decision could mean the difference between living and dying. We find three identifiable peaks, see the creek that we crossed in the previous morning and have a plan to get through the five miles as quickly as possible in the straight shot. This wasn't a typical hiking place, we were just short of jogging. Both to keep body temperatures high and to expedite the trek until we could get into my used Saturn view and pray that the heat worked. Four inches of snow, now weighing down on our footsteps, as we approached the creek. We remembered that the bridge we crossed before was another three miles out of the way, a distance we were unwilling to add to our already suffering bodies. We need to find a way over this water that was only now beginning to freeze, but quickly. Josiah heads northwest along the riverbank to look for a method of crossing. I direct myself southwest to do the same. The instructions were not to walk more than 200 meters away from the central location, so we could still hear each other calling that a solution was found. Within a few minutes, I hear Josiah's voice. A tree that had fallen over the creek offered about three feet of clearance above the hypothermic waters. I offered to cross first. Straddling this tree, I slide myself over the waters rushing below me, mistakenly seeing my pocket knife fall out of my pocket into the same waters. A mild inconvenience in any other situation could be the loss of a necessary tool for getting us out of this occasion. I cross the river choosing the creek bed to be the resting place for that knife. Josiah crosses after clumsier than myself. His foot dips slightly into the creek, dampening his socks. Our time to get to the car is now cut into minutes if we do not get his foot warmed. We sit down, take off his shoe, take off his sock. The cold wind and snow must have felt like knives against his skin. With our reduced movement and our cold fingers, I'm helping him find a fresh pair of socks in my pack, as he was wearing his last pair. Socks are something I always bring enormous quantities of during trips. I find the socks Josiah puts them on, struggling a bit to put on his shoe, but we eventually begin our voyage again. We traverse the last few miles of the wilderness to make ourselves back to the SUV. At this point, we're nearly running towards the vehicle, five inches of snow. I unlock the doors, dump our packs in the back, and we turn the key. The car revs and the sound of engine roaring over the snow was like cries of victory we deserved. I kept the car in parked, pushed on the gas to rev the engine to about 2,000 RPMs, heating up the cabin for the two of us. We could finally fill our fingers, we could finally fill our toes. Driving back over the mountain, listening to the radio, weather forecasters mocking us by their explanations of how serious this unforeseen storm is, and that school districts all over the county are closing for the following Monday. We get back to my farmhouse at the time, heat up coffee, eggs, and laugh about how we nearly died twice in the last 48 hours. After breakfast, after nearly dying, Josiah drives home. This story still haunts me. I work as the county historic preservationist in Southern Appalachias. Worked on the buildings and properties the county owned. One of the quote benefits included with my job was living on site at one of the historic properties. The historic house was an imposing brick mansion built in the 1810s. And I lived in a small caretaker's house about 20 feet away. This was in the backwoods, so, to the deer trespassing and vandalism, the county had built an eight-foot-tall fence around the entire five-acre parcel and put the barbed wire on top of the fence. I mention this all just to show it was basically impossible for anyone, or anything, to jump or climb the fence onto the property. One night, after working late at another property, I pulled up to the entrance gate, letting myself in, locking it behind me then drove the hundred yards down the gravel road to my home. There were no lights on the property, so I could only see my headlights. As I turned my car around the corner of one of the alt buildings that parked it, my light shone on a thing that I still have a hard time describing effectively. It was the size of a deer, 
but with long, spiny legs and long, shaggy hair, almost like a taller, maned wolf. If you've ever seen pictures of one of those, that alone shook me as there was no way something of that size should have been able to get through or over my fencing. What follows is absolutely true. I got out of the car to get a better look at what the hell this thing was. As I opened the door and got out, the thing took off running. Not on four legs, but on two. I literally watched this thing raise its back up, stand at full height on its back legs, and sprint away. I freaked out at the point, grabbed my mag light and my shotgun from inside and tried to find the thing again. There was no trace, no tracks, anything. I have no idea how it got or got out of my property. I did not sleep at all that night. Just sat on my couch with the shotgun watching the front door, hoping that whatever I saw did not come back and burst in. I cannot explain what I saw that night, but it still raises the hair on my neck every time I think about it. I used to own a horse boarding and training farm with about 45 acres surrounded by woods. I used to spend the night there quite a bit because I had to start chores early in the morning so if I stay too late, it was not worth the drive home. One night, at about midnight, my dog started to bristle up and growl at the door of the office I slept in. And then, my iPod, which I kept on a speaker in the middle of the barn, started blasting out Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire at full volume, which I definitely had not left it on. Let me tell you, that song is ducking freaky as crap in the middle of the night. Like, crap your pants freaky. My dog was full on growling and barking at the door, so I cracked it and let him run out, figuring that if someone were in or around the barn, he'd get them. Anyone there would have been trespassing at this time of night. After a few minutes, I went out to the office into the barn aisle with a bat to turn off the creepy music. The light I usually kept on I could see was off, so it was pitch dark. My dog was just staring at the barn door which I kept open in the summer to keep the horses cooler, with his hair bristled but was not leaving that barn, which he was allowed to do. I wrote it off as creepy but ultimately just one of those things, you know? Like, it's weird, I can't explain it, but there's gotta be an explanation. But the real scary part is that my property shared a private gate in back with the property closest to mine, which had a gate at the back. Most of my property was fenced because of the horses, and the property next to mine was like dozens of acres fenced with a chain-link fence, which if you know anything about rural fencing is not done. Anyways, we found out later that the owner of the adjoining property was Todd Colehip, the South Carolina serial killer. He had a woman chained up like a dog in his property who he and his friends would take advantage of and walk around the property on a leash. He also had some bodies of people he killed buried on the property. He was doing all the stuff while I lived right next to him. In fact, I used to ride on his property but would always turn around if I heard machinery. In retrospect, probably burying bodies or got the creeps. Like something would tell me just to turn around and go home. I was probably one of the few, if not only person besides his friends, to go to the property while all this was going on. What would you guys do if you found out your neighbor was a serial killer? Let me know in the comments below. Midnight Monster has daily content on the most unexplained and creepy events that have happened on this rock in space. Make sure you subscribe as there's plenty of scares to share.